This, this is, is TLV1. The Tel Aviv Review. Hello and welcome to the Tel Aviv Review. I'm your host, Gerard Halpern. Every week we bring you conversations with authors about the books and research and other things that we like. And if you like us, please consider becoming a Patreon supporter by going to our homepage. That's tlv1.fm slash tlvreview. Scroll down to the bottom and click the big red button that says Patreon, click and support us. Some of you have been doing this for months and years and we simply cannot thank you enough. My guest today is a distinguished professor emeritus of history at the University of Maryland, College Park. Specializing in modern German history, he, he has written extensively on anti-Semitism and its formations in 20th century Germany and beyond. He has recently compiled some of his writings into a collection titled The Three Faces of Antisemitism, Right, Left and Islamist, newly published by Routledge. Dr. Jeffrey Herf, hello and welcome back to the Tel Aviv Review. Well, hello, Gilad. It's a pleasure to be here yet again in Tel Aviv. So the book looks at manifestations of Jew hatred coming from very different worldviews that have essentially very little in common. What elements of antisemitism do all three have in common? There are two that, uh, that stand out in this collection. The first is uh, the view of Judaism, uh, which both for the Nazis uh, and for the Islamists Uh, are extremely hostile. Um, what both the, the Nazis and the Islamists have in common is that they radicalized the traditions of Christianity and Islam. And there are elements in the sacred texts of both of those religions that can be selectively read that fuel uh, hostility to Judaism. So uh, that's one theme, the, and the hostility to Judaism as a religion then became hostility to the Jews as a people. And then the second theme is more secular and modern, that is all three of these forms of anti-Semitism attribute the Jews uh, as a, a people with enormous power, power to do evil uh, and influence, be, form a threat to all of humanity. This is essentially a conspiracy theory that surfaced in Nazism most dramatically among the Islamists and then with the breakdown of communist solidarity with the Jews, in, uh, especially during the Cold War, it surfaced again in, um, in modern communism. How are these modern phenomena different from earlier ones? The secular tradition, which is called anti-Semitism made many of the same points that uh, the centuries of anti-Judaism made. But instead of focusing only on the religion of Judaism, it then began to view the Jews as a race. The traditional Islamic and Christian antagonism to the Jews was not a, a form of racism. Um, in the Spanish Inquisition, Uh, the association of uh, blood li lineages with the Jews in inaugurated uh, the tradition of, of racism, but uh, the, it was only really in the, in the uh, 19th century that, uh, that the modern tradition of, uh, emerged of what we call anti-Semitism that, uh, that equated those of the Jewish faith as being of a particular race. And once that was made, then the possibility of conversion from Judaism to other religions was gone because uh, uh, this was viewed as some kind of in in eradicable biological phenomenon. And uh, with that break of uh, and, and the definition of the Jews as a race, then the genocidal uh, implications of anti-Semitism uh, emerged. And is that also the case when it comes to radical Islam? You said that It, um, contemporary radical Islam radicalized notions, anti-Jewish notions that existed in previously in Islam. Can you elaborate on that? Yes. Uh, the, I, I decided to collect the essays and publish Three Faces of Anti-Semitism uh, because uh, I have published large monographs. As historians do that. Uh, the evidence requires three, four, five hundred pages um, uh, to convince My, my historian peers, that the evidence does support the assertions. Uh, so 
historical research is by definition and inevitably uh, something that requires very long attention spans. And in that sense, it's, it's countercultural and out of phase with uh, uh, social media and the inst- and Twitter and wh- what have you. But I thought it was therefore necessary to take selections from the books and uh, put the main arguments between two covers so that people could, um, could see these three different currents of anti-Semitism. And, and what distinguishes anti-Semitism from racism towards people of color, and one of, one of, the, one of the essays, uh, several of the essays address that issue, is that whether it's in European colonialism or uh, American enslavement of African Americans, racism based on issues of color historically has imputed inferiority, stupidity, uh, laziness, uh, uh, incompetence uh, to people of color, and uh, lack of intelligence, uh, hypersexualized uh, being, and uh, a whole set of pejoratives that imply and assert inferiority and lack of common humanity. Uh, so this form of racism is a form of inhumanity and evil, but anti-Semitism is a racism, but its most important element is not about racism, uh, or rather it imputes to the Jews superiority and imputes to the Jews enormous power and great intelligence, which makes this small group of people uh, so dangerous. And that is the, the logical implication of racism towards people of color is colonialism, is enslavement, uh, is loss of citizenship, and that historically is what has happened. Uh, But not genocide, not an effort to eliminate a whole people, whereas the logical implication of radical anti-Semitism is genocidal. That is, it is to eliminate the Jews because I saw Friedlander has made this point, and and I've made it. I, I've made this point. Other historians have as well. That that uh, for the radical anti-Semite, uh, the elimination of the Jews is a redemptive act that will liberate humanity and uh, bring in new era of human happiness into being once the source of evil is gone. And that is something that you know most famously and obviously in hundreds of books was evident with Hitler and the Nazis and the Holocaust, but it also was there, this impulse to extermination and annihilation. It also was there in the emergence of Islamism in the 1930s, and it was certainly there on October 7th, 2023. But I don't know if it is a major difference, you tell me, that really anti-Semitism and this instinct to exterminate the Jews was really the fundamental organizing principle of Nazism, whereas it it is not necessarily among Soviet communists and uh, radical Islamists. Is that a major difference, or is it just just a, a well? Let's take the communists for the, uh, uh, first of all. The state of Israel would not have been established without the help of the Soviet Union uh, and Czechoslovakia. Uh, And in my Israel's Moment uh, book I published in 2022, I elaborate the extent to which the Soviet bloc, uh, the Soviet Union and the Soviet bloc uh, was far more important diplomatically and militarily than the United States was for the success of the Zionist enterprise. Uh, In 1947, 48, yes. And then then, uh, things, of course, switched completely in late 48 with the anti-cosmopolitan purges. And in the process the Soviet Union uh, redefined the meaning of anti-fascism. Uh, the, uh, uh, amazingly, it, it began decades and decades of describing anti-fascism as the struggle against Zionism. One of the distinctive features of Soviet and then leftist anti-Semitism is that from the beginning, it has always asserted that it is not anti-Semitic at all. Uh, in that sense, it's a distinctive, in my view, chapter in the history of anti-Semitism. It's the first time people who were, atta- who were attacking the Jews insisted that doing so had nothing to do with anti-Semitism. It was, quote, only a form of anti-Zionism. And that, of course, was evident in the support for the Palestine Liberation Organization and the United Nations resolutions. And th- th- this secular a- anti-Zionism was a bridge 
in the history of anti-Semitism between the Second World War and then the reemergence of, of Islamism. The Islamists, whether we're talking about Hajim al-Husseini in 1937 uh, in Blue Dawn, Syria, and his Islam, his Islam and the Jews speech, or Husseini and others on the Arabic language radio broadcasts of the Second World War from Nazi Berlin, or uh, the Hamas Charter of 1988, differs fundamentally from Soviet and communist and leftist anti-Semitism because the Islamists make no effort to hide the fact that they are proud of their attacks on the Jews. And for them, there is no distinction between the hatred of Judaism and the effort to destroy the state of Israel. So, so uh, I think that in that sense, Islamism has much more to do in terms of the logical implications of its policies with Nazism than it does with communism. Yeah, but, but these uh, blatant attacks uh, on the Jews were also characteristic of other sec uh, sectors in the Arab world, I don't know, Nasserism and Arab yes. nationalists. Yes. What do you think distinguishes uh, a radical Islamism in this sense? I'll repeat what I said. R radical Islamism is proud of its war against the Jews. And it transformed the struggle, uh, a conflict between Israel and the Arab states into a war of religion. Nasser, uh, Saddam Hussein was more ambiguous, uh, Assad, more, but for, for them, the, there was always an ambiguity about borders and territory. The Islamists eliminated that ambiguity. They were very clear that negotiations, um, Oslo processes, uh, diplomacy was a, just a complete waste of time because the, the goal was clear and unambiguous that there should be no Jewish state in what uh, Hamas and the Muslim Brotherhood called the Islamic area of the Middle East. It, it was a mistake. It, was a, it, was, it should never have happened. Now, your questions, though, your questions are, are, are very much to the point, because uh, when one reads, for example, the Palestine Liberation Organization Declaration of Independence in 1968, the goal is to destroy the state of Israel, destroy the Jewish state. And it justified that as a, a goal of global anti-imperialism and the global left. And uh, though in practice, what the PLO did was to wage war uh, against Israel, um, uh, eventually under Abbas, the Palestinian Authority made noises about coexistence. But so I think in practical terms, and here I'm responding to your questions, in practical terms, uh, the PLO leadership never fundamentally made the decision to give up the right of return. It never finally said, okay, the war is over, and because the war is over, most people are not going back to what is now Israel. We're going to form a state of our own. We will live side by side. We don't love the Jews. We don't love Israel, but we're not going to try to destroy it. They never fundamentally made that decision, because in order to make that decision, they would have had to have taken on the Islamists, for whom any compromise was out of the question. So uh, when one thinks, why hasn't this why hasn't this conflict been settled uh, in 75 or is it 76 years now? And the reason fundamentally that it hasn't been settled is that there is a significant percentage of the Arab and Palestinian population that agrees with Hamas, that for them, this is a war of religion and there is no compromise. And uh, that sentiment of opinion has, has, has stood in the way of countless airline shuttles and negotiations and diplomatic efforts. So I think it is the construction of 500 miles of tunnels. Uh, and then the uh, attack of uh, October 7th was the logical culmination of those decades and decades of ideological fanaticism. One of the benefits of putting these three strands of anti-Semitism under the same roof as in the book yeah. is really to examine the uh, maybe the flow of ideas between them yeah, and how you know they can be measured against each other. Can you maybe elaborate a bit on insights that you probably that you had in the in the process of really examining the three against each other? Well, one of the things that that uh, 
intellectual and cultural historians uh, uh, have been very interested in in recent decades is the um, the impact of ideas from one part of the world on another part of the world and how different cultures influence one another. And sometimes this produces quantum mechanics or uh, the Gutenberg uh, Bible or the Beatles. And, but in the 1940s, in 1930s and 40s, uh, there was a cultural fusion between the Islamists and the Nazis. And they learned a lot from each other. And the Nazis learned from the Islamists that there, there was a way of interpreting the religion of Islam, a way of interpreting it, that led to conclusions that were compatible with Nazism. Uh, and that way of interpreting it was offered by the Islamists. So Islam is a, is a distinctive 20th century phenomenon. And the Nazis learned that, that the radicalization of Christianity and the modern secular form of, of anti-Semitism in Europe was not unique. They were not alone in the world. There was another major cultural tradition that agreed with them. Not Islam per se, but Islamism. Do, do you think they were really instrumental in creating this uh, uh, I think, interpretation well, of the, Islam? The, 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 Islamists, the, the key text of Islamism emerged in the 1930s before the Arab exiles went to Berlin. And so that was not a product of Nazism. That was a product of their own creative or malevolent interpretation of the Quran and the Hadith. Uh, and that's evident in the famous text, Islam and the Jews, which I discuss and others have. But the Islamists learned from the Nazis because the Islamists knew how to interpret the Quran or the story of Muhammad and the Jews and Medina in ways that were uh, hostile to Judaism and who interpreted Zionism as just the latest chapter in seven centuries of Jewish antagonism to Islam and other nonsense like this. But the Islamists learned from the Nazis the modern conspiracy theories of secular Europe. There's no way you can get them out of the Quran. The Jews are murderous. They kill the prophets. Uh, but uh, the notion that the Jews run the world, that uh, they caused the French Revolution and World War II and World War I and all that, that's the protocols of the elders of Zion. That's Nazi propaganda. And the Islamists learned that from the Nazis. So they, they learned from one another. When we talk about the impact of Nazi propaganda on the Middle East, yes, but it went the other way. It went the other way. And, uh, and it, it, it left after effects and aftershocks that, um, that lived on in the Muslim Brotherhood and, uh, uh, and, and then in Hamas and uh, Hezbollah. Iran as a whole is another story, but there's also uh, there's some lineages there with Nazism as well. The point here is that Islamism is a profoundly reactionary phenomenon. It is a, a phenomenon of the extreme right, which is, it's important to say that because a prominent English professor in the United States who people pay attention to for some reason, declared that Hamas was part of the global left. This was a, a completely stupid and ridiculous notion. And when one re, one, one of the essays in 2014, I wrote an essay about the Hamas charter which I, uh, Hamas is unknown fascist charter. And still, I think there are many academics uh, and writers around the world who have not read the 1988 charter. Uh, and if, if one reads it, one sees that it, it really is in the tradition of the extreme right uh, globally and in, in any other in European context. There are many things to say about the implication of the, of your work as a historian mm -hmm. uh, for the uh, for this uh, present uh, moment, and I have a few questions about that. Yes, but let, 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 let's take it. I mean, if you look at the world today in the twenty first century, mm -hmm. well, of course there are some residues, but Nazism is of course almost non existent. Yeah. Nothing like it was in the nineteen thirties. The same for Soviet communism. I mean, it doesn't have nearly the same power that it had throughout much of the 20th century. Uh, Islamism is perhaps on the rise, but still relatively inferior to other uh, um, mm -hmm. forces uh, uh, around the world. What does it teach us about 
Jewish life in the West and also for Israel? Is it really a, a clarion call for uh, rallying around uh, a liberal cause to fend off all these fundamentally anti-Jewish, illiberal uh, ideologies? Well, I, I am a dyed-in-the-wool liberal, and uh, the, uh, my work as a historian for decades has been in the tradition of liberal historiography. I describe the current moment as an era of simultaneity, and by that I mean that these three faces of anti-Semitism are operating simultaneously uh, in Europe, the United States, and around the world. At, at uh, the present moment. At the present moment, yeah, in terms of the the nationalist right, the, 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 the white Christian right in the United States did, declares itself great fans of Israel, but, but I, I don't trust that. That's a distinctive feature of the 21st century, that all three of these traditions of Jew hatred and anti-Zionism are operating at the same time. I've lived my career in the universities, so Nazism has no respectability, zero in the universities, um, uh, certainly not in the democracies uh, in Europe and the United States. But in the, in the universities, leftist forms of anti-Zionism and, and, and apologia and justifications for Islamism do have a presence. I think one point I, I, I make implicitly in the book, I don't think I, I elaborated this point in its pages, is when I was a young historian, my generation thought that if we wrote detailed and well-founded uh, histories of the Holocaust and of Nazism, that that would strike a blow at anti-Semitism. And I think, obviously, uh, th that is one necessary element of doing so. Uh, but what we've seen in recent decades is that there are people who uh, are willing to acknowledge that the Nazis murdered 6 million Jews, but then compare Israel to the Nazis. So it's necessary, but it's not sufficient to have a museum to the Holocaust or to remind people about the Holocaust. Also in the, in the foreword to, to the book, uh, sociologist David Hirsch says uh, that scholarship of Islamic anti-Semitism has been generally avoided, has been scarce. Yeah. And he says that it's for fear that it might feed, it, feed into and bolster Islamophobic prejudices. Yeah. Um, what, how do you see your uh, responsibility as a scholar and, and as an intellectual to prevent that from happening? Well, here I, I would draw attention to the a very important essay by Pascal Bruckner, Un racisme imaginaire, it's in English, an imaginary racism, and I, I think it's about 10 years ago. And Bruckner is a brilliant, you know, French essay. And uh, there is, of course, a prejudice towards Muslims in the United States and in Europe. But uh, the concept of Islamophobia is not a scholarly concept, it's a political one. And it, its purpose is to intimidate uh, scholars and others from examining the Hamas Charter of 1988 or reading Husseini's Islam and the Jews or paying attention to the speeches of the Iranian leadership. But if you're seeking uh, contemporary relevance or maybe general relevance yes. for your scholarship, it has to address issues that are within the public debate, like Islamophobia, right? I think that it is, it is not Islamophobic to point out that the Hamas Charter of 1988 is a viciously reactionary and document that fosters hatred of the Jews because they are Jews, it is condescending to assume that, um, that, this, is a re that this is a representative of the, of the uh, religion of Islam. In my work, I have thought that the principle no double standards applies. As a historian of Nazism, I and many, many other colleagues in Germany, France, Britain, the United States, Poland, uh, Israel, all over the world, Australia, have written many books about the connection between the radicalization of Christianity and its presence in the Nazi regime. 
I think it, it would be a consensus among historians to say that without the radicalization of Christianity, without the, the, the accusation of deicide over 19 centuries, there would not have been a, a Holocaust. Hitler's term final solution was there for a reason. Right? Well, the same level of criticism that applies to the history of Christianity. And we, and we, I am among those historians and others are, who have pointed to Roosevelt and Churchill and the philo-Semitic traditions of Christianity uh, uh, and the extent to which there are, there are elements in the history of Christianity that, that celebrate the contributions of Judaism to Christianity. Uh, we have done that. But the same level of criticism and empathy that applies to Christianity must be applied to Islamism and Islam. And it is not Islamophobic to point out that when uh, Osama bin Laden or uh, Hajim al Husseini or uh, Mr. Sinwar cite various quotes from the Quran, they're not making them up. They're not making them up. They're reading them selectively. But we will not be intimidated. I will not be intimidated because uh, younger historians have uh, uh, have to worry about being called a racist. If you're an Islamophobe, that's some form of racism. Well, it's not because if one were to say that it's Islamophobic to discuss critically discuss the Hamas Charter of 1988, does that imply that the Hamas Charter of 1980 is is somehow representative of Islam? Is that what we should say? Because if that's the case, then that perception that the Hamas charter is somehow representative of the whole religion of Islam, that would do more to fan the flames of hatred against Muslims than the work of Jeffrey Herf or Matthias Kunzel or Bernard Lewis or Pascal Bruckner or Bassam Tibi, uh, uh, all of us have tried to make those distinctions. And we regard our allies as liberals, as the liberals within the Muslim world. It is a, a small trend, but uh, one, one sees it in particular in Morocco and a few other places. Yeah. To what extent do you think that your specialism as a historian of modern Germany help you in um, considering anti-Semitism as a global, universal category, and to what extent it perhaps hampers you, um, you know, blind spots, etc. That's an excellent question. I have to think about it a second. For me, as a Jewish historian, over the last 40 or 45 years, I and my colleagues, uh, Anson Robbenbach, my dear friend, and uh, uh, Saul Friedlander, and uh, uh, we have been the irritant in modern German history and our colleagues here in Israel too, who have pushed our German colleagues to address these issues. And some of our German colleagues on their own address these issues. And we have an international community of people of, of uh, the older generation, my generation. We brought that issue from the margins into the mainstream. And we're proud of what we did because there was a lot of resistance to doing it. So the effort to, quote, come to terms with the crimes of the Nazi regime for us was never a cliche. It was not primarily talking about Anne Frank and the universal uh, human inhumanity of the Nazis. It was uh, never again meant that this could happen again. And it could happen probably not in Germany again, but it might happen somewhere else. And while there was no shortage of inhumanity in the world, uh, Mr. Stalin, Mr. Mao Zedong, various other ethnic hatreds, Cambodia, the Red Khmer Rouge, I, uh, other things would come to mind. There was a special obligation, I felt, as a historian of modern German history, to recognize when Jew hatred emerged, to call it by its name, and to do all I could to see that it didn't. Uh, happen again. So it's no surprise that there are young and young and not so young German liberals. I mentioned Matthias Kunzel, uh, Ingo Elb, Stefan Grishad, Ulrich Becker, my late friends, uh, 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 Sigrid Moischel, uh, Annette Kahana, 
uh, Wolfgang Krauss, and the, the list goes on, uh, people who regard themselves as liberals for whom this is a life task. And so when the Iranian leadership thundered that Israel is a cancer that needs to be liberated, uh, eliminated and that they were going to build nuclear weapons, or when Hamas made its genocidal threats, what we, that is myself and other historians of Nazism, what we thought about was Hitler's prophecy speech of 1939, of January 30th, 1939, in which he said that if the Jews, quote, started another war, it wouldn't end with the extermination of the Aryan race, but the extermination of the Jewish race. And he did it. So for us, when people speak this way about Israel or about the Jews, we take them very seriously. Uh, and we think that taking such statements seriously is a form of historical realism. And uh, it, people often may not think of intellectual and cultural historians as, as the realists in the room, but that's how we think of ourselves. At least that's how I think of myself. All right. Dr. Jeffrey Herf, thank you very much for coming on again. And many thanks to Itai Shalem, the manager of TV One Studios. And now we've got a request because many or most of you listen to us on the Apple Podcasts app. And we would like to ask you to please consider writing us a review. Good, bad, ugly, up to you. You too can support us by going to our website and subscribing onto our Patreon campaign. Check out our archive. It has probably close to a thousand interviews by, by now, if not more. Like us on Facebook, follow us on Twitter. And most important, join us again next week for another edition of the Tel Aviv Review. And until then, from us here in Tel Aviv, goodbye.